Okay, so the term novel, why is that term used? Well, it's novel because novel really means new. And this is new in the sense that we, as in humans, have never known that this has existed uh, for until, well, really, it's only, we've only known this existed about uh, uh, three months ago is when it was first really discovered. It's probably been around for millennia, but uh, it's only been, uh, uh, you know, it's new to us. It's not really new, but we're calling, it was called the novel coronavirus. And then, you know, virologists and you know, regulatory bodies decided to name it, you know, SARS-CoV-2. And then the infection or the disease that it's that, that causes is called uh, COVID 2019. Okay, so what is so unique about this particular strain or virus? Well, it's it's you know it's it's a there's a few things that are unique about it. There's a few things that really aren't. The unique feature is that it's it's brand new to us and that we've never seen this before. So we're really learning a lot about its biology, its uh, clinical manifestations how it's transmitted. Uh, so there's a lot of new features for, for us to learn about. And, and, you know, I think the rapidity at which this has been done is unprecedented. I mean, we have, we've only known this has existed for three months, and it's incredible how much we've learned about it. Of course, there still are lots of unanswered questions, but, uh, you know, we have a pretty good understanding of this virus right now. Uh, but, uh, but of course, there are some not so unique features. It's a respiratory virus. We sort of know other respiratory viruses, how they're transmitted, how we protect ourselves against them, how we protect uh, transmission in community settings. So some of the same rules apply as well. So is there enough commonality between this virus and ones that we've seen already leading into the spring? Will it follow a similar seasonality as soon as North America gets into some warmer temperatures? Yeah, it's, it's really tough to know how this is going to play out. And there's a few theories about uh, what direction this is going to go. One theory is that, you know, we're having a, clearly a, a big epidemic globally. Some might say it's a pandemic. And, and gradually this is just going to burn itself out and maybe go away. So that's theory one. Theory two is that we have this uh, a large surge in cases around the world. And then it dies down a little bit. And we just sort of have year-round low-level transmission of this uh, virus. Not, of course, to the same extent now, uh, but, but just year-round low-level transmission. That's theory number two. And then theory number three is where we have this uh, global surge in cases. And then it dies down, but it sort of seems to come back in the winter, just like we get seasonal influenza viruses. Maybe this will come back. Uh, and we have a seasonal coronavirus or seasonal COVID-19 virus. And that's, that's theory number three. No one really knows. I mean, these are all, this is all pure speculation. But really what that tells me is, you know, the key thing that really we need to work on is vaccination. Because it is plausible that this will be sticking around for a while in some way or another. And in order to protect ourselves, uh, we really need to invest heavily in a vaccine and of course that work has, has started a, a couple of months ago and you know it, it takes a long time to develop a vaccine but that that's really a long-term solution to this so as north america starts to enter into the summer is it possible that with us being sort of the global world that we are now and as easy as travel is that this switches and becomes more of a southern hemisphere issue through our summers up here their winters down there uh it's I don't really know, to be fair, and no one really knows. You know, that might align nicely with the seasonality component. But we have to remember that many of the normal rules are not being upheld in the context of a big epidemic. So you recall uh, 2009, we had a big H1N1 pandemic. And, you know, that's an H1N1. That's an influenza virus. That's supposed to be a winter virus. But that exploded in the summer time. And there were tons and tons of cases in the summertime. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't think the same rules for seasonality necessarily apply in the context of an epidemic. After the epidemic, after this epidemic or pandemic, whatever we want to call it, you know, maybe that will happen and there will be a seasonal component, but, but no one's sure. This is pure speculation for now. So you're saying that there is an initial introduction into a population that it has the potential to spread rapidly and then it just sort of plateaus and then may start following in the seasonal norms of what we would see with the common cold or the flu? Yeah, I think what's going to happen is we're going to see this rise in cases globally, which we're seeing right now. It'll, you know, it'll, at some point it'll peak and we'll start to see waning of cases. Uh, as as is being seen right now in, in China and maybe early signs in, in Korea. 
And then, then comes the big question mark. Then it's, you know, is this just going to peter out and die out? Or is this going to just have very low levels of transmission year round? Or is, is this going to come back in the uh, cooler months in, in the wintertime? And much like we see uh, seasonal influenza. So one of those three things is going to happen. No one's entirely sure which one, although people have very strong opinions one way or another. Is there any speculation as to how long sort of that initial bright burn phase is with something like this? Are we talking about like yeah. two more months <laughs> and then it sort of conveniently falls into that transition into seasonality or yeah. is it something that this could last six months on the initial phase? Yeah. So short answer, nobody has a clue. Long answer. We think we have a clue because we can sort of model it. A lot of this really depends on how the global response goes. And, you know, if we if, if we really see uh, some of the social distancing measures employed and some of these uh, travel restrictions and, and, and sort of methods that we know can slow down transmission of this virus, this might actually prolong the epidemic. But what it will do is it will blunt the peak of the epidemic and it'll just make it a, a more flattened curve, which is actually a good thing. People might think, well, why would you want to prolong this? But the reason you you'd want to prolong it is because if you have these huge peaks in cases, that means um, even though a small proportion of people get really sick and need to be hospitalized with this, if the absolute number of people infected is so great, those peaks will result in you know a, a high burden of hospital use and, and that can over, uh, overwhelm a healthcare system. We saw that in, in Hubei province. So, you know, it's, it's better to really employ these control measures, uh, at, mainly through social distancing and, uh, and flatten that peak so that it might be a little more prolonged, but you just don't get those big peaks in cases. Okay, so is there anything that actually comes into play with a virus like this and the weather changing, or is it something that can be more tied to people's activity during those seasons? It's, I don't know. I honestly don't know. I mean, we know that many coronaviruses uh, are fond of colder temperatures, but in the context of an epidemic, it's hard to say if the climate and temperature will actually have a role. So it's, it's really hard to know if that's going to be a major component to, uh, to how this epidemic plays out. Certainly, it'll, if, if this virus sticks around after this epidemic, temperature may come into play if we see some component of seasonality. But it's, it's just hard to know during the course of an epidemic how the temperature will, uh, will really affect it. Some people think it'll burn out in, in, the, uh, in the summer months. Other people think, you know, there's no chance for that happening as long as there's uh, transmission going on in a susceptible population. It'll keep it'll keep going. Uh, but, you know, this is, uh, you know, sadly, this is a bit of a wait and see approach. And really what we need to do is prepare for the scenario where, you know, weather does not it affect the epidemic. And we're, we're, we're prepared for that as well. So what does that look like? Uh, what sort of preparation are we are we talking? Well, in, in general, I think the preparation it, we have to think of this on several fronts. One is the individual front. There's a sort of a healthcare system front, and then there's a larger organization front. At, at, from a healthcare system standpoint, we need uh, obviously to have capacity in outpatient clinics so that pe people don't have to go to hospital for testing and don't have to go to hospital for care because we know many people won't need it. So standalone clinics are starting to pop up around Canada, and we'll likely continue to see these pop up over, over the weeks to come. And that just keeps people out of hospital and keeps people uh, home recovering in the comfort of their own home. We need uh, expanded diagnostic testing, which is which is also happening and happened in Canada. Um, and uh, we really need to ensure that we have the appropriate hospital capacity to manage the potential of a surge in cases uh, if, the, if it comes to that. So that's from the hospital level. From an organization standpoint, so businesses and you know, other, you know, companies and schools, I think we have to have a lot of flexibility here. And if there seems to be a large rise in cases, uh, there may be policies enacted that facilitate social distancing, meaning, you know, enabling people to work from home, maybe doing uh, schools staggered, not having all the students at, at one time in the school, or maybe having some homeschool sessions as well. Um, you know, really 
changing how we go about day-to-day life so that there's more distance between people and I know and not the same degree of large congregations of individuals under one roof where we know this infection can can be transmitted. Um, I think there also needs to be a lot of flexibility with uh, ensuring that people who are unwell don't come to work. You know, many companies have policies of sick days or vacation days, but you know, now's not the time to be stingy.